My name is Kathy Burns. I am responsible for the Produce Marketing Association, which is a global fruit and vegetable association that brings the global fruit and vegetable communities together to ultimately grow a healthier world. Um, tactically or aspirationally, I get up every day thinking about how to inspire people to eat more fruits and vegetables. Tactically, we represent the whole supply chain. Uh, from the seed manufacturers all the way through to the retail, uh, retail distributors, retail stores, and food service operators. I share that context because as we come together as a global produce industry, we also not only are the voice for the industry, but we also work together to really move platforms and challenges forward. Obviously, all this week we've heard one of those challenges is how are we going to feed uh, the number of people that are going to inhabit this world uh, by 2050. And if we need 60% more food, we hope that the majority of that will come from the fruit and vegetable space. And we also know that the intersection between ag and tech and sustainability and food security is really important. So that's what this panel is going to talk about today. How do we leverage ag tech and food security to get prepared for the future? So uh, I have David, I have Her Excellency Miriam, all the way from the UAE. Uh, we have Bob and Charlie. And what we're going to do is I'm going to ask each of them uh, to share what they're, what, about their organizations and what they're doing in this space. So David, why don't, we, why don't we start with you? Happy to. And I was told to say, cue the images, if, <laughs> if they can. So and these are, I'll talk while these are going on, but there's some slides in a, sh in a short video showing our eighth, so that's uh, one of our farms, and just keep rolling, I think there's a video, and our uh, eighth and ninth <coughs> farm. So here, uh, we recently built the uh, largest vertical farm in the world. Uh, vertical farm we define as layer upon layer of plant growth, and uh, here we grow without sun, without soil, and um, we've grown about 400 different varieties of plants. We believe we could grow anything, which doesn't mean we should grow everything. Uh, we focus on what we understand makes economic sense. So ambitiously, we're growing other products. And within a couple years, uh, well, next year, we're going to uh, commercialize a very different type of crop. Um, and it's both focusing on like the labor component, the energy component, the capital cost, the, the operating cost, the inputs, all of these things. Uh, so we're a technology company, about 130 people, constantly attacking the cost structure, the quality. Uh, increasing uh, our food security, so reducing risk in areas where there could be food security uh, coming in. In leafy greens, where we focus on salads, 11% uh, of all food contamination, think E. coli, salmonella, listeria, comes from this category. And in a fully controlled agriculture system, uh, we, could, we, we can reduce a lot of that risk. Um, and we also developed a way of growing without any pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and uh, not washing. So often it's washing where a micro contamination becomes a macro contamination. So there too, by not having anything to wash off, keeping the leaves pristine, uh, we're able to uh, create a, a better quality product and reduce risk. My biggest surprise in this journey I'll share is uh, how we influence taste and texture. So the idea is indoor farming, food doesn't taste good. And, really very different from that, and this is attributed a lot to the tech and the data science, we're as much a data science company as anything else, constantly changing variables, finding different ways to grow, like changing minerals <coughs> and elements, maybe one variety wants more iron, another wants more zinc, another wants more magnesium, some ones wants more red spectrum, some blue, like blue spectrum, some more CO2, O2, there are like all these variables we change to try and cater to a, a vegetable and not just optimize yield from cost, but taste, texture. So I'll end on the quick example of kale. So we could take kale that's otherwise very bitter and very rough and make it more tender and softer. So for those of you in the New York, New Jersey area, you could buy the product on uh, Fresh Direct if you want to try it. I'm sorry I don't have any leafy greens here to sample, but um, it's coming and it's spreading as, as an industry. What's the cost difference between what, you know, big ag produces and, and what you produce in your vertical farm to so the consumer? So we, we sell um, through like ShopRite, 
uh, Whole Foods, Fresh Direct, uh, super um, restaurants at the same price as the field farmer in the category of organic. So that 20% premium is important. Uh, the cost structure is going down. And as a, as a business, so tacking a, the, the cost structure, inputs were there where we need to be, yields were where we, we are where we need to be, um, the uh, energy were where we need to be, labor, we're attacking labor now, our labor's high from a business model standpoint, and we have automation in seeding, harvesting, cleaning, packaging. In September, we're rolling out our fifth model that's automating between all of that Great. to reduce the labor component. Great. Thanks, David. Her Excellency Miriam, uh, congratulations on your recent appointment back in October. I'll Thank let you, you share a little bit about that and what you're doing in this space. Thank you very much, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really it's wonderful to be here. I mean, the Malkin Conference uh, global uh, global conference is really for me a stage where, uh, thanks to them, they've made a beautiful uh, food track, which a lot of us in this room have been following. And um, I'm honored to be here. And uh, just want to give you just before I go into what the UAE or where the food landscape is in the UAE, if we think of food security, what is food security? So it's accessibility to nutritious, sufficient, and affordable food at all times. And looking at that in the context now of the UAE, so we're, we're not Saudi Arabia. Okay, a lot of people <laughs> confuse Saudi Arabia with the United Arab Emirates. Saudi Arabia is our, our big brother, our neighbor. Um, we in the UAE, so if you look at the world map, and we're basically on the right, small country, just over 9 million population now, uh, and over 200 nationalities. And so it's in a way you think, okay, how can we ensure that everyone gets enough food? Looking at the 9 million people that are living there, plus, as my uh, colleague uh, Yusuf al Teba said yesterday, over 20 million tourists that are coming in annually. So how's the UAE feeding the people? Well, we're importing over, like, coming towards the 90% of all our food. Um, keeping in mind we are an arid country, we are water scarce, and uh, also the contribution of agriculture to the GDP is less than 1%. Okay, Keeping that in mind, we are still defined as a food secure. We are ranked 33rd on the Global Food Security Index. Uh, this is out of 113 countries. The US is on second place. Ireland is on first place. Um, why? Because we um, have excellent trade relations, we have excellent uh, logistic facilities, and we've really built global partnerships. So now let's look into the future. How can we ensure that we're still food secure in the future? We're going to have challenges, and we've discussed these in the last two days. Health issues, climate change, um, uh, the global food demand. So these are all, let's say, challenges that are coming up that I have to deal with now for, for the future. So what's the UAE doing to ensure future food security? Well, they've appointed a Minister of State for future <laughs> food security. And um, basically to show also or to give someone the responsibility, accountability, and to show that this is a national priority. My tasks, to give it to you in a nutshell, um, is Number one, I'm developing a whole of government, whole of country strategy, integrated, holistic, going from the individual to the household, all the way up to the UAE being a global player in the food security um, agenda. Second, driving agritech into the field of agriculture. So, I mean, the, the speeches I've heard, uh, the people I've met, the, the products, the food systems, amazing. And this is exactly what I want to really push for. In, in the UAE. Third, we want to really embark on a robust R&D agenda to ensure future food security. So these are some of the elements that we'll be working on, and this is one of the reasons why I'm here today and amongst you today. Great. What do you think is your biggest barrier? We've got quite a few <laughs> barriers. So, um, so number one, it's the technology is available. It's trying to get this technology on the ground and getting the companies, the people, and as, as I learned, the millennials, the Gen Zs, to actually start using these technologies and making a business out of it. Uh, number two, trying to get the, like, the youth engaged in agricultural business. So they think of agriculture as digging their hands in the dirt. 
But now when we look at the smart agriculture applications, we're looking at Internet of Things, we're, we're in the fourth industrial revolution. Agriculture has taken such a big transformation. So these are some of the challenges. And the, all the agri-tech that we've been seeing now is really how we can grow our foods in a closed system using much less water, which is very attractive for us. That's great. Good. Thanks. Bob, how are you going to help that at Monsanto? <laughs> yeah, so uh, hopefully in a lot of different I ways. <laughs> so first of all, I'll just introduce myself. So I'm Bob Ryder. I'm with Monsanto um, in research and development. Um, I've been in the industry now for almost 30 years, 20 of those with Monsanto and um, have spent that career and uh, worked with others there, really driving innovation and helping to take technology both that we invent and then ultimately apply it so that we can help you know, our customer farmers, um, whether they're small farm operations, smallholder farmers, or whether they're large operations around the globe, and really helping them to produce and do that in a way that can be um, used less resources. And so, that's really the goal, and I think what's really cool right now is, is, as the other speakers have already mentioned, is we're at this incredible inflection point where we see data science, we see artificial intelligence, and that starting to interface with things in biology like gene editing and some of the traditional things that we work on. And, and it's been amazing in my career. I look back when I started at Monsanto 20 years ago, um, and we were just at the beginning of thinking about doing things like, you know, how do we look at the DNA of a plant and then use that information to make a decision? And, and we did it in a very, very simple way at that time. And then today I look at where we are. And um, just as an example, I've got this little chip here, this little two inch by two inch chip. Um, this represents roughly 14 acres of research plots that we use. And um, you know, to, we can basically today, with just uh, a couple hundred of these chips, we basically now have replaced an entire year's testing in our research programs with a crop like corn. So, um, and I think of the, the progression that, that's taken place in that. And, and that's, we're still scratching the surface of many of these areas. And so it's, it's exciting to see what's happening. And, um, you know, I think the biggest limitation we have, honestly, is, is, is talent. Mm -hmm. um, I think we, uh, you know, agriculture, um, how many of you in the audience here uh, have grown up on a farm? We got a few hands, mm -hmm. right? But the vast majority of just, didn't grow up on a farm. Mm -hmm. It's interestingly, David, you, uh, your operation is in New Jersey, and that's actually where I got interested in agriculture as a, uh, having my own vegetable garden, and I tried to be high tech, although it's certainly nothing to compare with what you guys have established, uh, you know, but it's, it's an exciting time for us. So what's the next new thing coming out of Monsanto that you can talk about? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really, it, it's really how we're now applying data science and using it to help our farmer customers in terms of decision making. Yeah. You know, we talk a lot about um, in production that there's probably roughly 40 key decisions that a grower needs to make throughout the growing season. Um, and those decisions historically have really been made by, you know, farmer smarts and their experience and what they share at the coffee shop and what we can provide as, as companies or from the universities and other places. Um, and today we're shifting that to becoming a much more data analytically driven decision making process. And what that translates into is it really does help growers make better decisions in terms of you know, what they plant, when they harvest, how they grow that crop, how they fertilize, um, ultimately, again, really with the objective of helping them make them more successful, more profitable, and use le less resources. So, um, and it's, it's, it's going to be a really great journey. That's great. So 60% more food with, what, 3% more irritable land? Charlie at the International Farm Farmers Corporation, how are you going to help us? So quick little background on yeah. that. So I run a real assets platform. Uh, we focus on food sourcing solutions uh, for food buyers, whether that be uh, food security folks or CPG companies or private label companies. And we have a, uh, our real assets platform, uh, we have a baseline of land, about 400,000 acres uh, on a global basis. And what we try to do is match up the productive capability of that land with food buyers. Uh, the other thing that we really focus on is once we have that productive land, how do we process some of that food to make it more valuable? And I, I think that it's absolutely fascinating what's taking place from an inflection point in agriculture today. What you're seeing is that you're seeing that you had fragmented farmers historically, and I'm talking about the U.S. market, and then you had these aggregators <clears throat> that would buy food uh, from the fragmented farmers, and they would take 
10, 20, 40, 50, 60 percent of the economics. Today, and then they would take those, those uh, food supplies and they would sell them to their customers that were more fragmented. Today, with the land platforms that are beginning to be developed, you can go directly to the food buyer. And so there's a lot of economic value that you can extract that was not, and it can stay with the farmer, uh, and you can have a much better quality uh, of food with all the traceability and trackability that's available. So there's certainly, a, to, to your point, Kathy, lots of change taking place in agriculture. Um, I think it's you know, an incredibly exciting place to be, and I think uh, folks are, are, the other really key trend that's taking place is people are seeing food uh, is medicine. And that concept is totally changing how people uh, consume food and, and it's, uh, it's reorganizing the uh, supply chain mm -hmm. uh, as well. Absolutely. Again, biggest challenge? What are you bumping up against? Uh, biggest challenge? Um, well, water is always a, a mm -hmm. big issue. Um, you know, I look, we're, we're active in Australia, for example, and they have a much, much better, uh, more evolved water uh, market. Uh, than the U.S., for example, there's severe challenges in, in California, uh, very uh, problematic. And the land in California trades uh, with the water uh, as a general rule. Uh, you look in Australia, and for example, uh, you can get a mortgage against water that you can move from land uh, in different basins. And so the benefit is, is that what you really want to do is how do, you, how, do you, how do you create the most economic water? How do you create the most economic value per unit of water? And so, um, you know, that's something that in the Australian market has been, has been really well developed, and I think it's something that we can learn from here in the U.S. market. That's great. Mm -hmm. Good. So, David, I'm curious. Um, it's great to have pictures of a few farms that you've already uh, have up and running, but how, what do you think about in terms of scalability? I mean, that's, as we look at specialty crops and fruits and vegetables, how do we, how do we move faster? How do we move quicker? Obviously, capital is a part of that. But where, how do you see us scaling these opportunities? So there are different ways. And this is, agriculture is a good place for public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. And uh, Charlie was just talking about water. So policy often inhibits innovation. So if water is subsidized, you're taking away one of the biggest financial tools for Silicon Valley to solve problems in water. Uh, there's just no economic gain. So aero farms, a lot of the crops we grow, we could use 95% less water to grow a crop. And we've invested a lot in filtration and keeping these closed loop systems where we take out um, algae and leave in nutrients and mic micronutrients and create these closed loop towers. But that's driven not by financial motivation, it's just you know, wanting to do right. The, um, so policy, if you kind of let prices of water go up, then people will solve and, and solutions to solve water would be more robust. I mean, ultimately, we're focusing on reducing capex, reducing opex, and getting the business model work. The hardest, another financial gap, there are a lot of finance people in the room, is debt. So um, it's, it's hard to get debt for big innovation, innovative projects that, that are capital intense. Uh, so we kind of patch it together with impact investors. But true senior debt wants three years of progress to really go in. and if. In a, an innovative company like us. So the last image that you saw, Goldman Sachs and Prudential invested in us in, in, at the project level, but very hard both out of their impact investing groups. Hmm. So that's, so there is, um, if, for those of you who saw like Speaker Ryan talk about these opportunity zones, policy like that really does have an impact to drive innovation to certain areas or otherwise to kind of get uh, businesses going to underdeserved areas. We're in Newark, New Jersey. Newark, New Jersey is a tough neighborhood. We're going into Camden, New Jersey for economic reasons. Another area is necessity. So we're actually going to be going to the UAE. We have a, a partnership with Moras. And here, um, it's, it's just an exciting market where people are, about, are very excited about being first. Some markets, all right, we want, we want to be the second person to go there. Dubai especially is one of these areas, Abu Dhabi as well, where people want to be first, they're not afraid to take chances. And here, um, one of the exciting, in terms of fruits and vegetables, I'll share it's with the kids. Yeah. So we try, uh, we have these things called like uh, salad, salad days where everyone's welcome to have salads. We've hired, in our ninth farm, we hired 30 past offenders. And people, and it's not the past offender demographic, but people from, a, from certain demographics don't eat a lot of salads, and it's very hard to change behavior. We're all done. If we're not eating it at this age, the people in this room, we're, it's probably a funny looking green food, but it's the kids. So we put a farm in a school in an inner city kid in, a, in, in, a, in Newark, 
and it's run by the sixth graders, K through eighth grade, and it started changing behavior where the kids are choosing the salads instead of the fries. Mm -hmm. And uh, Michelle Obama came, mm -hmm. visited it with her, like nutrition on childhood obesity, fighting that. And it seems like there's some magic there where we could really start changing uh, eating habits and, and oh, I want to absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, this is exactly what I mean. Hearing that there's um, uh, interest in coming to our part of the world and and using agritech to to change behavior. I mean, this is exactly what um, I really want to push for. And you really see, for example, to to drive this consumer behavior change, it's it's the taste, and. We, I mean, looking at the vegetables that we get, we're importing more, most of our food. So the lettuce, the apples, the carrots have actually been on the road for months. Mm -hmm. And the taste is completely different when you're tasting it fresh. And these are, this is exactly, so this kind of vertical farming pr principle, you can put it into a, a container and put it deployed in schools and communities. They can actually try and see that this taste is so much better than what they're getting in the supermarkets. So we're exactly also embarking on a, a dive into the public schools, which will be starting uh, towards uh, September, to actually understand the connection of the kids with food and how our canteen set up. Maybe we have to change the whole, why, why, why do kids get excited about a happy meal? It's colors, it's packaged in such a good way. Why don't we do the same principle at schools, get them excited about eating good food? So this whole, it's, it's, for me, it's a big, it's a transition, it's a game changer, and I'll call it a movement that we're trying to do, which, which will take time, but it's a behavior change. Also, I mean, in our culture, it's very much any guests coming, the more food, the more they're, like, you show the hospitality, and we need to change that to make people feel, don't be ashamed for serving less food, it's okay. <laughs> So that whole, the food waste, everything com comes into that as well. Yeah, we have high hopes about the millennials and the Gen Z yeah. uh, coming up behind them. Boomers are defecting at rapid rates out of vegetable consumption, over 30% uh, decline in their vegetable consumption. So uh, targeting that next generations will be critical as we move forward. And I must say, you've come a long ways. I first went to his farm when they were in an R&D facility, and it was an old paintball uh, room with fluorescent <laughs> on the walls, and I'm like, oh, oh, tons of MIT scientists uh, obviously creating what you have today, so it's great to see. Any comments on, quick comments on scalability from either of you? Well, I, you know, as a provider into mm -hmm. these farming operations, I think one of the big opportunities that we see is that, um, you know, crops have not been bred for those environments. Um, and so as consumer preferences change, as the technology in terms of how we grow these crops changes, um, there's a huge opportunity, to, I think, to really tailor the breeding and the output of those breeding programs to provide better in a way that creates products then that can be more successful in these operations. And, you know, as consumer taste preferences evolve and change, you know, we, we certainly know and, and we've seen sort of this shifting in terms of the demands coming in terms of our seed products, in terms of a desire to see changes evolve in terms of flavor and more of, uh, you know, traditionally I think breeding, particularly in vegetables, has been more focused on making sure that that crop's going to survive, right? It's disease resistance, it's the yield that the grower's going to get. Um, so it's a real opportunity, I think, in terms of, of realigning where, um, what we're doing in breeding and how we can apply that technology and hopefully make these operations much more successful sustainable and really applied to the downstream consumer that wants to buy them. Yeah, that's great. So let's talk about the conflict between science and marketing. If you think about the production methods and there's local and organic, there's non-GMO and GMO, how does ag tech play in, in this space? I, I'd like to make a comment on ag tech. So with our business model, we're focused on a secure and reliable food supply at scale. <laughs> And so with all of those acres, what we found is a lot of the tech companies want access to those farmers and they want access to all those acres. And so what we'll do is we'll do, we have model farms and we'll test new technologies on those model farms. And the ones that work, we'll push across our entire platform. And it's, it's remarkable the amount of yield increase that you can get and also not increase your cost in doing so by adopting some of these technologies. And I'll give, you, I'll give you a couple of examples. I'll give you kind of a past example and a present example and one that we're doing in the future. So 
A past example, we, had a we have a $300 million farm that's 50,000 acres that we worked on for about 10 years. And this is in the mid-1990s uh, to, to 2005. It was just after the Gulf War, and I don't know if you all remember, those Scud missiles coming across and, and the um, precision-guided uh, technology that was introduced. Well, ag was one of the major benefactors uh, very quickly from private industry after that, that, that war. And so in 1995, what we began to do is we began to do grid sampling across all of the farms. And so in the past, you would mix fertilizer and you just spread it you know, willy-nilly across, uniformly across the, uh, the farm. So in that case, what we began to do in our, our family, uh, we, I'm a seventh generation farmer and our family's been in, in the fertilizer business for a long time. And so what we did is we decided, uh, let's geo-reference and let's measure 20 different soil characteristics and let's do variable rate application across that 50,000 acres. And over a 10 year time period, it was remarkable. We actually decreased fertilizer input by 60% over that time period. And at the same time, you think, well, what did yields do? I hope yields stayed steady. Yields went up 70% during that same time period. So I think technology can make a huge difference. Um, another example, a more recent example, is we incubated a, an imagery company that does predictive analytics based on biodensity mass. And the beautiful part about it is your eye cannot see the density, the biomass density of a plant. But with this imagery, what we were able to do was to go in and do intervention programs where you could tell that you had a, you know, a disease pressure or water pressure or whatever it may be. And so that's a way that we were able to increase yields about 57, our, our latest numbers were 57% higher growth yields uh, than the USDA averages. So there's lots and lots of different ways to, to unlock value uh, from, a, from a, a land base. And the last thing I'll say is we're, we're pretty active in some of the tree fruit uh, industries. And so some of the technology now that's unfolding is robotics. I think robotics are going to be a big game changer, especially with a lot of the labor issues that you're, that you're facing today. And so robotics now, you can have uh, cameras that can see the consistency of the fruit and they can go in and suck those fruits harvest those fruits and do not a lot of damage on those fruits. And so I just, there, there's just dramatic change that's, that's taken place. And the whole key is, is how do you provide a reliable food supply uh, at scale? And I think, David, some of the things that you're doing are remarkable and, and wonderful. But then also you've got to have a balanced you know, food basket, if you will, uh, with some of your tree crops and some of your, your trees and your fruits. Um, and then also your grains. Uh, you know, consumer preferences are changing dramatically. Organic grains, sourcing that is incredibly difficult. So um, it, it really is an interesting time, and that supply chain is, is uh, completely becoming realigned. So where would you place your bet? What, what piece of technology would you invest in? <laughs> well, I think robotics are very interesting. You know, certainly very interesting. I think uh, microbials mm -hmm. uh, within the soil um, are, are uh, less invasive mm -hmm. and natural. I think that's a really uh, positive thing. Uh, I like some of the things that, David, that you all are doing for sure. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, lot of, lot of opportunity. And then some of the water savings techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, we've increased uh, our economic water, our economic output per unit of water by about seven to 14 times by putting the right amount of water right where it's needed. So um, lo lots of great opportunity. Great. Science and marketing. Got to yeah. hear your perspective on this. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think we sometimes focus a lot on the differences, mm -hmm. and, and the reality is there's just a lot of commonality, and especially as we think about it from the ag tech perspective. So, you know, one thing, one thing is certain about plants is that um, we may choose to grow them differently, mm -hmm. but uh, they have all the same common needs. And so we think about um, how data science can be applied, doesn't matter whether it's applied on a small share owner farm or whether it's applied on an organic farm or whether it's applied on a... 10,000 acre operation in, in central Illinois, um, those same principles still apply. Um, so I think that you know, one of the things great about science is it's a great democratizer. Um, I think about artificial intelligence and decision making, those will apply across the broad spectrum of agriculture, it doesn't matter what the operations look like. Um, we have technologies emerging that, um, you know, I think about, you mentioned microbials, you know, that's a fascinating one. You can take a tablespoon of soil and you can find a billion different microbes in it. Um, and we have very little understanding about what all those different microbes do, why they're there. We know that there's been some coevolution in terms of what has been planted and grown there. 
and what isn't. You mentioned, uh, you know, measuring different data layers in the environment in the soil. Um, you know, we, we collect probably about 250 different layers of environmental data that happen on the farm and try to figure out, you know, which of those matter, how do those work together, what, how, do, how does that affect the growth of the crop in terms of its success. Um, so, you know, I, I think the summary of it all is, is really is, is that, you know, there's, there's an opportunity in terms of making sure that we allow choice and preference um, and that there's, you know, I think these things are very compatible with each other regardless of the way we choose to produce a food and the kinds of foods that we choose to consume. Great, thanks. Her Excellency Miriam, what's your, so, your oh, reaction? I look at it from, of course, government lens. Um, for example, the UAE has an organic logo. So farmers can, if they adhere to the conditions, they can take the UAE organic food logo. What that's done, especially with uh, technologies advancing and being soilless technologies, they can't actually use the organic logo. So this is where we're now developing a new logo for the UAE, uh, looking at sustainable agriculture. So those systems that use less water, that use less natural resources, no pesticides, etc., can be um, branded in a way that the consumers know and have the trust that this uh, product was made uh, as naturally as possible uh, with the na most natural ingredients. So this is something that will really sort of uh, set the stage for unbiased um, uh, agricultural uh, techniques. So this is something where we're pushing so that technology can actually transform the agricultural uh, sector in a way that we haven't seen before. And AI, uh, quantum computing, uh, genetics, it's, it's all coming into it yeah. as well. That's great. David, do you hyper-local and organic and, <laughs> and, and, and? <laughs> so we, uh, um, we, we developed another brand. The name of the company is Aero Farms. We developed a brand, Dream Greens. And uh, part of me regrets this decision one, it's hard to build one brand, let alone two, but, but more um, philosophically, it's like the Dream Greens, which is the, the consumer-facing brand, represents what the product is. Um, and at first it was driven because we thought the customer might have an adverse reaction to how we grow. Like just no sun, no soil, what's that about? Um, so we don't hide it, but we put it on the back of the label. And on the front of the label, it's no pesticides, fresh, flavorful, safe. It's, it's what the product is. And, and what I'm finding, what we're finding, is that the customer's intellectually curious and excited by how we grow. Very hard to tell the story when someone just sees the product and makes a, like a couple second uh, purchasing decision. But, it's, um, but we, as an industry, need to, uh, can do a better job explaining the how and the why. And it, it's really interesting, and part of it is genetics and at best of breeding, part of it is environmental stresses. Uh, so for everyone to uh, like intellectualize, like the way I look at it is similar to nature versus nurture. How much of us are who we are because of our, our genetics and who our parents are, or whether um, we have like blonde hair or tall, whatever it is, or how much of it is the environment we grew up in. I grew up in the Bronx, or, or I have a certain eating habit or exercise regime and so forth. And, so at Aero Farms, we, we started focusing just on the what's called the environmental stresses to develop a plant. Um, just like if we eat differently, sleep differently, exercise differently, it changes our biochemistry. We could, as weird as it sounds, get a plant to eat differently, exercise differently, sleep differently, and change their phytochemistry. And that's how we develop a peppery arugula or increase vitamin A and so forth. Um, but the other important side is the, the genetic side, whether it's best of breeding or or GMO, and, um, and I think as an industry we could do better of explaining that. And here, I, like, we don't use GMO at Aero Farms, but it's not, that's not because of a philosophical decision. It's actually not available in specialty crops. Mm -hmm. um, but whether it's CRISPR-Cas9 or GMO, there's a lot of benefits, personally, I think that could come from this. Mm -hmm. And often um, the media doesn't understand the depths of the, of the conversation. and um, and so we just need to facilitate the dialogue better. Yeah. So where are you, yeah, go ahead, I was Bob. just going to add, yeah. the, I think the one thing that we need to do a better job of is, um, it's just in the overall communication, right? I think we start to use certain words as labels and they start to symbolize something. And I don't think people have a, again, 
um, because people today, for the most part, particularly in, in the you know Western world, we grew up in the city. We don't have an affiliation to farming and agriculture, and so even our understanding of the basics of of how food is produced, and we start to see these labels emerge, and it creates confusion. And I think we just need to do a better job to represent, you know. Um, what is really scientifically right or wrong, and then allow people to make the appropriate choices. So I think um, you know we'll talk a lot about transparency. I'm sure later, and exactly. I think that's a really key key thing that we want to make sure that we keep in front of us. So let's talk about that now. Transparency. Obviously, generations are demanding this. What are you guys? How are you addressing it? I think um, <clears throat> I think transparency is critical. But before you can have transparency, you need traceability. That's so. True. How can you trace exactly mm -hmm. what I'm getting some nods in the front row? How can you trace exactly what is going on up and down that, that food supply chain? Absolutely. And also at the field level, how can you trace what you know, plant health products are used, what seeds are used, uh, how much water is used so you can report on improvements? If you can't measure something, you can't improve it. And so what what I think is really important is, is investing in technologies that that enable that traceability. Uh, we've spent a lot of time investing in blockchain enabled uh, immutable ledgers so that farmers can't change it. And then the second part of the equation is once you have that traceability, then how do you make it transparent uh, to the buyers of the food? So we, we grow a lot of uh, potatoes, for example, for Pepsi. And we provide traceability down to the practices that are taking place right on that land. And then we make it transparent to them based on their attributes that they like. And so Every buyer of food has different attributes. Uh, Her ex Excellency, Miriam, you were re talking about organics or non-GMOs or whatever it is. Um, having that transparency available to buyers of food is, is absolutely critical. And what's exciting is this, in today's market, the technology is now available to make that visible. Are you using blockchain? We are. We are. Great. Good. Transparency. Thoughts? I, I can say extremely important now. Mm -hmm. The consumer is wanting it. Um, I see it here very much, yeah. <laughs> um, but I can see the trends also um, coming in our region as well. So people are starting to actually flip the products and look where it's coming from, what's inside. Um, the whole idea of organic is very, very, I mean, for us, uh, we love to see things where organic is on it. Um, but you see that I, I think the health issues that, that are coming up, uh, obesity, cardiovascular diseases, cancer at a much earlier age, all, all these things, people are actually feeling it and seeing it. And most of them, it's like, okay, I think I have to change the way I eat and not just empty calories and what's actually good for me. And I mean, there were many discussions of what, what is what is the, the, the perfect nutritional balance? And I think every region is also a little bit different. Like you might be eating a lot of potatoes here, whereas we're probably eating more rice. We love our seafood. So there's, there's a lot of uh, like dietary um, changes and having over 200 nationalities in the UAE, that's also something we, mm -hmm. we have another challenge to look into as well. But I, I feel and I can see that it's becoming of high importance and even the whole labeling system is starting to look different as well when if you look in the past years. Yeah. David, what's your perspective? So a, a few points. One is, like, as we speak, we're working on Whole Foods. They have Whole Foods as an index because they're a customer, so we fill that out. We have an ESG. We're uh, certified B. We're doing a life cycle analysis. So. I'm into transparency at the same time. I, so we have to ask ourselves, what kind yeah. of company are we? Are we mm -hmm. someone that just fills out these reports, or are we trying to like get to work? So it it can't be. It can take a lot of time. So I think we do have to figure out like what, how it's it's less of a burden on companies, but but it's important. And the other part, just that I sometimes struggle with, um, like we we share a number. But for 99% of the people that look at this number, what do they do with it? So I'll, I, I'll say, all right, this is my energy load. And, and it's hard. So, so if it's, I mean, I know how I would break that apart and make it meaningful. Is it, all right, an energy, a unit of energy per like, pound of leafy greens consumed. So every word I just used is really important. And, and some of the differences, and this is, there's a, this is a very like detailed conversation, but to shorten it up, it's um, so if there's 60% spoilage in the supply chain, meaning what in our category of food, what typically comes off the farm versus what gets eaten, like 40% of it's going to get eaten. So do you measure the energy of what's eaten or what 
comes off the farm. I would argue you should measure what's eaten. Um, <laughs> then, and that's, and, uh, I'm biased, I'm, I enable local food production, so we, there's more, more, a better ratio of what we uh, produce versus what we eat in because uh, it's a highly perishable product. Another example is if we use 80% less pesticides, or, or I'm sorry, zero pesticides and 80% less fertilizers, and you look at a unit of energy in fertilizer, should that be incorporated in it? If, our, if other products were coming from California where 25% of the electricity bill is moving water from the Colorado River to Salinas or San Joaquin, should that be incorporated? So all of this is to say there's depths of complexity to the conversation and just giving a number as a standalone without a narrative doesn't really give information. And 99% of the people that look at it don't get that mm -hmm. and don't know what to do with it. Yeah. So I'm a, I agree transparency yeah. totally. It's evolving, it needs to evolve. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's, uh, he, he, mm -hmm. you're spot on in terms of we really have to think about what is the information that we want to create and be transparent about and how will that be used so that people are making you know informed choices and informed decisions and it's not just we're choosing to collect and we're choosing to share information that just creates more confusion or even is misleading or creates misunderstanding in terms of what you know we people really want to do with it the other challenge we have honestly is um, we have to automate a lot of this data collection um, you know in, in our business, you know, a few years ago we acquired a company called Climate that was a, a startup on the West Coast in California here, and it was working on weather and insurance, so it was doing weather modeling and then applying that to the crop insurance space. And, and we shifted that over, and, and what we do today now is, is we're really helping with this grower decision making. So as part of decision making, you have to collect data. And, and I can tell you that we have We've done a lot to work on getting a lot of that data collection automated. So we have a, a little thing that I like to call a puck, but basically it plugs into all of the, it plugs into your tractor or your combine that a grower has, and it helps to make that data collection automatic, and then it ports it over to your to the iPad for the customer, and then and then they can use it. Uh, when we ask growers to manually input information, 20% of the time it's wrong. You know, you ask the grower, well, what hybrid did you plant on this field, and Lo and behold, you know, a lot of the times it's incorrect, and so. Intentionally? Um, no, no. <laughs> Just checking. I, I, you know, I, I went to a I went to a memory session this morning yeah. here at yeah. the conference, and uh, I can assure you that, um, you know, we we all we all just are we're fallible in terms of um, those things. But yeah, I I think a big challenge here is is we have to be able to make that data easily accessible and easily collected. Um, and then we have to make choices in terms of what really makes sense and, and how it can be best used. Great. So before I throw it over to you, I have one last question for you guys. Average age of the farmer is 58. Most of the people that work for the farmer either wants to own the farm or run the farm, doesn't necessarily want to work the farm. So you mentioned talent uh, that keeps you up at night, Bob. Um, so I'm curious, how does, how does this technology and ag tech solve some of that issue and how quickly do you think that will happen? Well, Kathy, one, one other statistic that's literally fascinating in the U.S. market is, yeah. is the percentage of farmers that are part-time farmers. Mm. <coughs> and that number is 60%, yeah. which is just staggering. And so if you think of a farmer that's, that's right. a part-time farmer, they're not going to be using the, the latest technology. They're not going to be right. marketing their crops efficiently. They're not going to be able to focus on sustainability like they need to. And so you've got this consumer market that's completely redefining how you define quality. So if you come out of World War II, quality was safe. And safe to be safe, you had to be highly processed. And so now over the last you know, 50 years, we've had healthcare spending you know, triple, quadruple, spending on agriculture is down by two thirds. And so now quality, the consumers are coming back and saying, hey, quality is less processed. Uh, quality is fresher. Um, and so the technologies that will win will promote that new world order. And so I think um, that's, for all of us on the stage, that's the real key thing is how do you align with technologies that are promoting that fresh, healthy food mm -hmm. and visibility into how it's grown and who grows it. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the real opportunity. And how does that relate to talent from your perspective? Well, talent, um, you're going to have to... If we can redefine our industry as food solutions driving better health outcomes, 
that's exciting. Yeah. That's, that's very attractive. If we define our industry of, as you know, pulling tractors through dirt in rural areas, that's a lot more limited uh, talent pool. And so I think that the way our industry is going is to the former. Yeah. And if we can get that message out, I think you're going to have enormous uh, bright minds focusing on these food solutions. Yeah, so a big part is marketing. And we're sexy. I, product. I mean, I, we're sexy. I was well, thinking it. You said it. I think like, we're, our products <laughs> are so sexy right now. So we need to be able to leverage that. Bob, sure. talent. What's yeah, the talent. Focus? So a couple of thoughts. So the first is I agree with you. I mean, I think that um, when... You know, we, we work with a lot of startup companies, and a lot of times these startup companies have nothing to do with agriculture. And then we get them exposed to the opportunity in, in the ag space, and you can just see the, you know, the light bulb goes off, and you start to see and understand that, guess what, agriculture really is really exciting, it is really high tech, it is really sexy, and, and you start to see some of that talent opportunity infusion. Um, one of the things we've also done is, is we've set up um, at um, University of Illinois at the Innovation Park there where basically our, what we've done there is, is we've set it up so that we can have students working with us on projects and have them be exposed to agriculture, mm -hmm. right? And so these are kids that are going to school primarily in the data sciences field that don't have any experience or understanding of what agriculture is about and we get them exposed that way. So I think a big part of it is just more exposure but the last part of it is going to be you know follow the money a little bit and and the good news is and you know since 2010 I think it's something like 23 billion dollars has flowed into the venture capital space in terms of ag and that's a great thing yep. but then I also look at you know if you look at companies like ours so some of the larger companies that operate in the ag space you know we spend something on the order of like eight and a half billion dollars in research and development pharma spends well over 165 billion <laughs> so um, I think, you know, I think it, there's still an opportunity there where, and with the challenge ahead of us, you know, more investment in this space, I think, will also, I think, help us in terms of having that talent be part of, of what we're working on. That's great. Good. Yeah. Well, our landscape looks a bit different. Okay. So we have, it's usually the UAE locals who own a farm, but they don't actually work on the farm. Mm. And it's usually a, a, a workforce from Asia, mostly, that come and work on the farm. Most of them don't know how to read and write either. So very, very simple mm. techniques that, that they're using. For them to learn these new technologies is extremely difficult. So we're going to have to do a kind of like hybrid template farm, something where they, they can still do what they're doing, but then maybe be exposed to something new. So it's finding that, that, that balance to get them into the transition phase. But what's more exciting is the millennials, the Gen Z that are all coming up now and looking for new opportunities, so SMEs. So things mm -hmm. like knowing that Aero Farms is coming. When they get exposed to something like that and actually see it actually makes money, a 40-foot container that could bring a yield of a, of a one-acre farm and still make an ROI of nearly 20%. This is now, this, this becomes sexy. And this, this is something that, see, that sexy. really... <laughs> and this is something that, um, so uh, we've also got a Minister of Youth right. uh, in, in the UAE, and she's formed like <laughs> youth, uh, uh, youth councils around the country. And so I, as a minister, will go and speak to these youth circles and yeah. tell them about this, this new uh, agri-tech and what there is, and a lot of them are like, oh my gosh, this is, this is internet of things, this is, this, is every, this is digital, this is not, we're actually not really farming as in the old traditional farming anymore. So the excitement is there, and then with all the side sidelines, it's healthier, it's fresher, it tastes better, these are all like things that gives it even more, aha, uh -huh, okay, this, this has become really attractive now. So I really think that this new generation are the ones that are really going to push into the technology and, and um, innovation more in the agricultural scene. That's great. David, yeah. you, you turning talent yeah. away? <laughs> uh, well, we have so, much, so many people applying for it. Yeah. It's one of the hardest things. I hate saying no to great candidates. But mm -hmm. um, so we are, our three most represented schools at Aero Farms are Columbia, Harvard, and MIT. So we have like a, a tremendous amount of talent. And they didn't go to college to think they were going to go into ag. And that's like the second point is so we've we have a bunch of people with ag experience. The model that works best is not hiring direct experience but relevant experience and emphasizing 
conceptual problem solving. So we've like put together a whole case study on analytical problem solving, conceptual and quantitative, and, and it's the conceptual, the ability to kind of see solutions in other areas and apply them to a, a different problem is the skill set that we find is most successful at, at Aero Farms. And, um, and that obviously allows us to go broader to other industries. And we define ourselves as a farming company, but also as a technology company. The farming, being a farming company allows us to be closer to the problems to solve them. And uh, being a technology company allows us to be better farmers. Uh, so we're, we are able to bring people from relevant skill sets to here to have a big impact on our business. And, and that, um, that works really well in the office environment. In the operations environment, where we have like 30 past offenders and unskilled workers, the inspiration, so the inspiration helps. And we found the equation that works is having people that are intellectually curious. And here in a city like Newark, they, they're not waking up like thinking they're going to pursue a career in farming trying to skill, teach skill sets on plumbing, of being an electrician, or having a trade, not necessarily farming, because we want them to be able to do something else and get a job in their life outside of arrow farms. But the intellectual curiosity is the, the common thread. And, um, and so far, we're having a pretty good time, whether it's the mission-driven piece, the, what we're doing is, is interesting to people, but it's, it feels like it's illustrative of uh, maybe re representative of like if agri others in ag can do what we're doing, I think the industry is going to uh, attract a lot of talent. I just want to add something sure. to what, what you said, David. Another wonderful idea which we've come across is that closed system farming or urban farming, because it can be done close to where people live, yeah. you can actually involve the disabled people mm -hmm. who would never think that they would be able to be involved of such an uh, such a uh, and an activity to actually grow food and women as well. I mean, we have no women farmers, but I think this is going to change in, in the future. Sure. So this That's is great. something that I really think uh, will will come up in the future as well. That's great. So we have time for a couple questions. Yeah, right here. Uh, we're going to bring a mic right up to you. Thanks. Hi. Uh, good morning. Thanks good morning. for the, uh, the 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 great session uh, on the impact investing panel on Monday afternoon. Uh, there was discussion around forced migration. Um, and I think that forced migration as potentially a food security threat in the future, especially in Africa and the Middle East, could be, I mean, could be something that you guys, um, you know, will have to consider. Um, I'm just curious, like, obviously, you know, for, for a lot of us in the room, when it comes to food security, we think about, you know, a lot of food wastage. But the reality is, in the next 20 years, where the population, the human population is going to grow the most are in places like Africa, and mm -hmm. that's where a lot of young people are. So just my question for Her mm -hmm. Excellency, I mean, are you guys focused on sort of food security and sort of you know, these types of issues as they relate to a broader context of Africa and, and what yes. your role will be in, in that space in the next 10, 15 years? So uh, just before coming here, I was in uh, the EU and UN um, talk on the future of Syria. And that's where a lot of countries came together to pledge what they would do to help Syria and around Syria, what's happening. And what I see as well, it's, it's not just, we don't want to keep going and saying, OK, well, we're going to give money. I think we actually, Agritech could play such a vital role in, in developing something that can be deployed in these regions where the people can actually use it and grow their own food. So this is something that. I would really, I mean, this is something we are going to be working for in the future to devise something that can be put there so people can grow their foods. And I think this is, this is the kind of thinking we are doing, and it's extremely important. I mean, I would, we've got the three S's. We've got sun, sand, and seawater. And a lot of <laughs> the places have, have this. And if we can grow food using these elements, I mean, this, is, this, this would be really a fantastic uh, achievement for food security globally. Got a question up front. I can see a couple more hands. Thank you. Uh, so what we talked about this from a grower perspective, but with this, the rapid increase in uh, the scale and scope of technologies, how are you working with um, things like cooperative extension and farm advisors to adapt some of the training that's given to farmers? And then second, and maybe mostly for you, what's the future of uh, oil? cereal and uh, biofuel crops and vertical farming. That's great. So cooperatives, so the, any thoughts? Yeah, so, you know, uh, 
I was just at the University of Wisconsin last week, and, and they're reorganizing at the university the whole um, cooperative extension efforts in the state. And, uh, and the reality is um, if we're going to, you know, we continue to see sort of this contraction because of funding mm -hmm. challenges and extension, and less information, I think, is going to actually come from those traditional sources. And, and, but they need to still be there, I would argue, for particularly for um, some types of industries or areas where you know, there isn't going to be an opportunity for, for example, industry to be able to step in. I mean, I think companies like ours can help large row crop growers, but who's going to help that cranberry grower? Right? And so I think we do have to figure out a way of, of solving a bit of a financial problem in the co-op extension space. And it's not just getting them the information. It's actually giving them the funding and having people there that can do that Absolutely. job successfully. I think we may have to look at more models where those things are um, self-funded, mm -hmm. right? And, um, so I think that that's, that's, to me, one of the biggest challenges with the extension right now is, is just uh, the right funding mechanisms to, to sustain it in the appropriate way. Yeah. Okay, David? Yeah. Answer I'll, I'll answer this question by kind of giving a window into my journey. So uh, before Iowa Farms, I founded and led a nanotech company that was mm. had nothing to do with agriculture. Again, I'm from the Bronx. I know nothing about agriculture. So I started this inspirationally to help solve water. And then from there, just white piece of paper. And this was the better way to start a company. My last nanotech, I had a technology and tried to find a problem. Here, it's very much what problem and then bring a technology to find a solution to a specific problem. So started off in leafy greens because high rates of uh, spoilage, um, high rates of food contamination, uh, production consolidation in Northern California, and we again, allow, enable distributed, it's like a, uh, to a certain extent, a, a supply chain, disintermediating the supply chain model. And um, uh, high nutritional densities, so this is like check the social mission, and then um, also a high price per pound. So appreciating that when we introduce a new technology, there's often a premium that comes with that introduction. What segment of the market could absorb a price premium most naturally? So today, yes, there's a price premium, but, it's, but we don't sell at a price premium because the market, the prices of the market already absor um, absorb that. Uh, so to answer your question about biofuels or whatever else is relevant, I would look at it as, what pro is there a problem and would the economics that our economic constraints or model and where it's going and the trends we're improving capex opex etc where it's where it's not only in the future today in the present but where it's in the future could solve that problem and another quick example like leds there's something called heights's law that refers to like the efficiency of a diode improving similar to the concept of moore's law so when we made a bet um, in leds the economics were marginal then but that was in 2011, in 2018. Now they're really attractive. And, and we doubled down, made a lot of investments in LEDs. Uh, so there's going to be more and more products that vertical farming could help kind of be, have an impact. Uh, but that's the lens at which we uh, make decisions. Great. I noticed you just took the mic from the person sitting next to you. That's a brilliant strategy. <laughs> I, I thought it was important we spent a minute talking about climate change and of food course. security, so I'd love to Absolutely. hear your thoughts on yep. the adaptation solutions that are either most urgent or that you're most excited about. Great. Climate change. Good question. One last question over here as they answer, and then we'll close down. Yeah, climate well, change. climate change. So, yeah, food security. So we obviously... Um, we take it very, very seriously. We know that um, our crops are under more stress than they ever have been, and we can see in certain geographies the problems are confounded, despite the fact that in, in the central U.S. in the last four years we've had sort of record yields because of, I'll call it favorable climate. Um, part of the solution is going to come from the input side, which is, you know, as we breed these crops, we have to breed in more resiliency into them, which means we have to expose them to more of these challenges and then through selection we'll be able to create, I would say, better seed that is going to be able to more, be more adaptable to some of these environmental stresses. But the other part is just back to how we manage the crop and where we choose to grow it. Um, and so, you know, we, we've talked a lot about water mm -hmm. in this equation and it is the number one factor really in no terms question. of climate change. It's water and heat stress that we're going to be dealing with the most. And so. Um, all of these technologies that are helping us to better manage water, the choices we make in terms of how we choose to grow the crop. So, you know, the ag tech space I think is really well positioned right now to help deal with this. But 
the problem is coming fast. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there are things that I think we don't even quite understand yet in terms of how climate is impacting, for example, the pest spectrum. So what, you know, what challenges mm -hmm. crops were exposed to in a certain part of the world before and what they're being exposed to today is changing. Um, and so we have to really use the whole basket of our technology capabilities to really solve these problems. I think they're all solvable, but um, you know we, we have to be able to use everything we've got to do that. Just look what's happening with automated bees now. Yeah. It's incredible. The climate, I would just add really shortly, climate change is, is real. If you look five years ago, you know, corn was not in uh, you know, South Dakota, North mm -hmm. Dakota. Uh, Canada today, you know, corn is being grown in those regions, and so, but and with some genetics. technology. <laughs> and that's, te that's a lot of genetics. I'm just gonna just gonna that's tell you some, that yeah. that's some technology. But that it's the if you look at the volatility of crops, they the volatility is increasing at an accelerating rate, and so that's what you have to that's what you have to that's what you be have aware to of. Yeah. Yeah. I just also want to add something. So climate change in the UAE also extremely important national priority. We also have a Ministry of Climate Change and Environment taking care of that. But just to give you some insight on that, we're also, the R&D side is also looking at what f new foods, because we're actually, when you look at the ingredients that we're, we have in our foods, it's so small from the spectrum that we could actually eat. And I mean, we've come up now, there's there's a, a plant called salicornia, and I've discovered yesterday it was sea, sea beans that you can actually grow in seawater. It's, it's a vegetable, and it's a bit salty. So this is something nobody knows yet. So this is now where we have to market these kind of uh, products that can actually be grown using salt water. So these are the kind of things. So it's definitely high up on the priority yeah. list. They're throwing the red flag at me, red card <laughs> specifically. So please join me in thanking David, Bob, your excellent team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.